Welcome inside Conservation Ag Update, brought to you by Saddle Butte Ag and Biotill. Great to have you with us on our debut episode. My name is Noah Newman. I'm your host. Some quick details about the format of the show before we get started. So we want this to be like your one-stop shop for all things Conservation Ag. We'll have the latest news and trends affecting your operation, as well as feature stories, tips, and strategies from veteran no-tillers, strip-tillers, and cover croppers. So let's jump right in with today's headlines and a tragic story out of Illinois. Seven people lost their lives in a massive crash involving over 70 cars along a two-mile stretch on Interstate 55. Now, according to Illinois State Police, the crash was caused by excessive winds blowing dirt from recently tilled farm fields, which led to zero visibility. No-till innovator Randall Reeder shares some perspective on what we can learn from the incident. One of the main lessons we need to learn from this terrible accident and episode is the cost of erosion. Now, in the Midwest, most of our erosion comes from uh, water erosion, uh, rainstorms, and the loss in soil, the loss in our best topsoil, the losses of the fertilizer nutrients that go with that topsoil really adds to the cost of uh, farming every year uh, for our Corn Belt farmers. It's, uh, it's an amazing expense, and we need not to lose lose sight of that cost to farmers, as well as the cost to society as a whole. And our thoughts certainly go out with everyone impacted by the crash. Moving on, big news out of the strip till world, Case IH and AgGuru Machinery announce a new technology partnership. AgGuru founder Bill Preller says, quote, we've always said different isn't always better, better is always different, and we knew this technology partnership would result in continued research and better technology for AgGuru and Case IH customers, end quote. Now, as our partner Ag Equipment Intelligence has reported in the past, these types of partnerships can lead to acquisitions down the road, as was the case with CNH and Miller Sprayers. We have much more on this big story on striptofarmer.com. Shifting our attention now to planning season, what most of you are out in the field doing right now, and let's talk about a conservation practice that involves no-tilling into a living cover crop. We are, of course, talking about planting green. As we head out to Watertown, Wisconsin to catch up with a guy who knows a thing or two about it, no-tiller Tony Pyrick. He's been planting green into cereal rye for a long time. He started with soybeans over a decade ago and corn about eight years ago. So Tony, what advice would you give to people who are planting green for the first time or maybe thinking about trying it next year? It isn't hard to do. I get a lot of calls and uh, it's just a matter of uh, plants. You know, I got a couple calls this spring again from different guys. They're afraid of it. Uh, plant green and then just terminate it right after. You know, the glyphosate will terminate cereal rye very easily and it'll decompose down and it'll break down and it'll give you nutrients back to the corn as the corn's growing in late summer. So it, it's, uh, everybody's kind of afraid of it, the planting green there, but it's, it's, it's the way to do it. It's the way to plant because your ground will be, uh, it'll be a lot easier. You, a lot of time to get in the, you can plant a little sooner than you can in the spring because the ground will be a little more, but the cereal rye growing, it'll absorb some of the moisture. It'll get it good and mellow and it plants really nice into the cereal rye with the root structure of cereal rye. But it's a good crop. It's, you know, it'll suppress the nutrients that we need. We keep a living root in the soil and you keep your biology. That's the main thing you're looking for, keeping your biology alive. You got to feed your biology. Yeah, you were just showing me. I mean, the earthworm activity yeah, here is unbelievable. Yeah, they're just all out here. They're just they're just bringing everything together. They're all underneath there. It's all their their houses and their ball up material they moved already over their holes. Yeah, that's what you want. Your earthworm activity, major part of your soil biology. Good stuff. Thanks, Tony. Perfect transition into our cover crop connection segment. Let's send it over to McCain Vogel, who has a scoop on a new tool that's making life a little bit easier for cover croppers. Thanks, Noah. McCain Vogel here, assistant editor for Cover Crop Strategies. Two researchers at the University of Georgia developed a cover crop incentive tool that helps U.S. farmers find federal and state programs providing payments for cover cropping. They spoke with me for the latest episode of the No-Till Farmer podcast. There was a lot of confusion about what kind of financial incentives are out there for farmers um, in trying to support them in their use of cover crops. Um, I noticed that sometimes farmers were not aware that there were programs available to them, or if they were aware that the programs were available, um, they 
were usually showing some level of frustration because the information around the programs were not clear enough. Um, and so um, last fall, um, I was I had decided to do an independent study with a professor at UGA. And I decided to use that time um, to create a very basic version of this tool. Um, and so what I did was basically look at federal and state programs that um, support cover crop adoption through different kinds of financial incentives and try to summarize their main points so that that could be uh, one central place that farmers could land on and start getting to start getting a better idea of what's out there for them. So that's where we came up with the idea of the tool. The resulting tool is this spreadsheet that organizes the incentive programs by federal, region, and state. It currently lists information about programs available at the federal level and in Iowa, Ohio, Missouri, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Vermont. Explore the spreadsheet at covercrop-incentives.org. And to hear my full conversation with the researchers, go to notillfarmer.com slash podcasts. Back to you, Noah. McCain Vogel, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Staying in the South now for today's Ahead of the Curve segment, John Deere gives us an up-close look at some brand new precision technology. It was an action-packed day at the company's new demonstration farm in Austin, Texas. Right here, you're looking at autonomy in action. Product manager Joe Leifer from his phone starting a driverless 8410R tractor with a 2430 chisel plow attached. An, an easy infield activity to automate, though it doesn't have much value for conservation-minded farmers. And elsewhere in the field, Sea and Spray Ultimate, Deer's smart sprayer capable of spot spraying weeds among growing crops, spot spraying on fallow ground at a max speed of 12 miles per hour. The 120-foot boom has 36 cameras attached. And here's our first look at a new planter performance upgrade called Furrow Vision. It mounts onto row units and brings the eyes of the operator into the furrow. Jesse Hacker shows us how it works. And what we're doing right now with Furrow Vision is we're using those components to be able to identify depth. And so if you look over here, this is what uh, Furrow Vision looks like in the cab today. Um, you can get a live video feed of this uh, through our Connect Mobile platform. On the Gen 4 display, you can see C depth and um, it takes a little bit of time to adjust because of some of the filtering things that are going on right now. But what you'll see here in a little bit is that the depth changed and it turned red because my target depth was two inches. So for the customer's standpoint here, not only do they get eyes into the furrow and look, um, but the first measurement that we're doing with that technology is to give them an indication of depth so that they have a, uh, a little bit of an in, uh, idea of, do I need to get out of the cab and make adjustments on the machine? Furrow Vision is set to hit the market in 2024. All right, from Texas to California now for our farmer spotlight, we are paying a visit to no-till, strip-till, West Coast trailblazer, Tom Barcelos. The Tipton native was the first in his area to move away from the plow when he started no-tilling 26 years ago. Now he estimates 60% of all corn production in his neck of the woods is grown under reduced tillage practices. Today he no-tills small grains and strip-tills corn for silage mainly producing feed for 2,000 cows across his two dairy operations. Now, Barcelo says strip-till has proven to be the more practical option in his region's hot, dry climate. The self-proclaimed equipment junkie shows us the tools that help make strip-till work on his farm. We run two different types of strip-till bars here in our operation. Uh, we have the Bingham bar here in the front. Uh, you'll notice, of course, it has the coulter. We're running dual uh, shanks for the different types of soil. We got our wavy coulters, breaks it up, and then we have a pack wheel in the back. Uh, we use this on a little bit tougher soil that we run into here that maybe doesn't have quite as much organic matter uh, or a little more alkali style because we're dealing with something that needs a little more tillage in a strip till situation. The bar that we have run for over 20 years is the Orthman One Tripper. Uh, you'll see it's pretty well simplified. We didn't have to run uh, row cleaners or anything. Um, 
just our shank and our wavy coulters in the back and then we don't run any kind of compaction or anything in the back because the soil tilth is better in those areas and this is adequate for getting the job done and this has been our primary uh, tillage uh, strip till bar for many many years. Tom says strip till and no-till have also helped his family overcome labor challenges, skyrocketing fuel costs, and strict water regulations in California. Let's check out our video of the week. It is from Fulton County, Ohio, no-till legend, Les Seiler. Here he is showing off a two-stage ditch he built with help from the Nature Conservancy and his local soil and water conservation district. Now the ditch has drastically reduced erosion, slowing water down by nearly 10 miles per hour as it flows through during heavy rainfall events, and it also doubles as a pollinator habitat. Congratulations to Siler, who also recently received the American Soybean Association's 2023 National Conservation Legacy Award for his dedication to improving the land for future generations. And we'd love to see your videos and photos. All you have to do is email me at innewman at lesspub.com, show me what you got, and we'll get it on the program. That'll wrap things up for this first edition of the Conservation Ag Update. Until next time, for the latest headlines, head to notillfarmer.com, striptillfarmer.com, and covercropstrategies.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.